Robo brew. I don't remember what I was gonna say. What are you robo brewing? Try this one more time. <laughs> Generation three with the recirculating pump. Stay tuned on this episode of Genus Brewing because we are going to be unboxing and brewing our first beer with this guy. I brought beer. Whoa, you brought beer. Because I'm cool like that. I'm just a nice guy. Look at me. <sighs> okay. So anyways, yeah, we did the uh, the Robo Brew without the pump because that was the most uh, analogous to the mash and boil that we've done a couple videos with as well. Um, but, you know, the according to Kegland, the makers of the Robo Brew, very loud with all the styrofoam, um, the version with the pump is the more popular version, uh, and that makes sense. It is the most utilitous version, and it's basically like a half-off grandfather, from what I understand. Uh, so uh, we're gonna take this out and give it a uh, give it a whirl. So let's start in on the unboxing, and uh, we'll pull out of the box, show you some parts, and put it together for you. Yeah. Hello, Logan's not great at pulling out of the box. If you know what I'm saying. Cockward. All right. All right. What do we get for the, our first part out of the box? So uh, we've got some, some diddly doos, sparging arm. Got a tube. We'll figure out what all this means later. Uh, all right, let's see if we can do this without knocking our beers over. I'll pull, and you pull harder. <laughs> ah. 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 Are you out yet? Mm, not quite, let me finish. Not again. <laughs> Eat that eating scissors. Good packaging, just like anything else nowadays. We have the built in chiller. Now, look at that beautiful thing. Spigot. The front side has the same interface as the smaller version of the Robo Brew without the pump. Uh, same 500 watt and 1000 watt dual element setup. However, this one does also have a separate switch for the pump to turn on and off. And you have the corresponding female quick disconnect up top that goes into our male cam lock styles, which uh, just like that. One thing that's kind of annoying is that this is taped onto the metal. Oh, so yeah. that is kind of annoying. That's actually. gonna be. Pain to get off. About to get off. This little ball valve here. Um, that's not the highest quality ball valve, but it actually still is uh, 304 stainless as well. So good on them for doing that. So that's a rather crude mechanism of attaching these, but I suppose it works. It does let you slide it up and down, and that's going to adjust for the depth of your grain bed, I presume. So set that down in there. Noises. That goes on the top. So that drains any excess uh, water that's being sparged, correct? And these are part of the handle assembly. So now, as we've been saying this entire time, we are very competent on these and uh, know exactly what we're doing. Let's get uh, let's get going on the breakdown of what all this stuff is. All right. So you are holding in your hand a false bottom, but not a false bottom for the mashing portion like we originally thought. What is that for? This is a boil false bottom. What it's going to do is going to uh, separate everything from basically where the things drain into the pumpy. Uh, it's going to make it so the pump stays clear first of all and then it's also going to make it so that you don't scorch, which is a problem we had in this video. Using the mash and boil. Did the iCard, did it show up? Is it there? It must be there somewhere. Uh, so we get a little screw eye here that we are going to screw on to, uh, it looks like, the center of this false bottom. And that's going to make it easy for us to pull that false bottom out at the end of the end of the brood, I guess. Yep. And still don't know what that's for. Still don't know what this is for. This is probably going to sit on the top of your grains. Uh, for, as for the things that go into the bottom of the malt pipe, we have a kind of a two-piece false bottom here. Uh, the first pipe thread thing screws into the bottom false bottom and then you have this other kind of finer mesh screen that sits on top. Uh, it creates a little bit of separation which speeds the flow of liquid through the grain, uh, through, the, through the false bottom. Um, supposedly prevents some stuck barges, but uh, more importantly it's gonna be a really good filter because you have the double screen there uh, and you're not gonna get as much stuff, as much sediment down into the, uh, whatever it's called. So let's go ahead and put that in. It has an extension arm that you can adjust for the height of the grain bed as well. And then, uh, what did you say this was? It's kind of a 
inverted conical shape inside, so that allows excess wort that's been recirculating on top of the grain bed to go down through this tube. Um, a lot of this comes less assembled than we would like. Knobs. For example, those knobs for which I brought over uh, a screwdriver, uh, but these knobs are what go onto the top of uh, the lid for this whole thing. You would think that they could put the dang knobs on there. I know, it's kind of weird, but uh, and, you know, we can take care of it, whatever. Uh, the packing for this was nice, so that's, you know, probably part of just kind of keeping everything up. Oh, well, this is actually a nifty feature. So you can Sorry, actually yeah. spin that around because of the way the cam lock works. Yeah, and then if you're like, hey, I just want to drain this into my fermenter, skunk. Arr. Perfect. You know what? I forgot something. Yeah, now we're ready to go, right? We're ready to go. So they only give you one gasket on this ball valve. Uh, for the little bulkhead that goes in between. I'm going to go ahead and assume that that goes on the inside. Uh, just because usually it works better that way. If you have two though, I'll put one on each side. Alright, so we got a gasket on the inside. I'm going to slide that gasket around our threading that you can't see right now. Oh yeah, you're in full penetration mode. Come on inside. So you can see here I have my gasket and I am going to thread my nut on. But now that we have that first, like we should have done in the first place, we can install our kettle false bottom. It's gonna get loud. Next, we can install our. What is this called anyway? Malt pipe. Malt. Malt pipe? Malt pipe. This is the malt, the full mechanism is the malt pipe. That's the malt pipe. Okay. <laughs> this is not the most convenient uh, way to do that. The mash and boil has a little uh, handle that folds flat on here. Way more convenient. Our malt pipe technically. Um, which is where we're going to do all of our mashing in. Make sure we have it lined up right. Why is nothing working? That guy. Slide down like so. We'll actually sit on top of our grains once we get them in there. If we choose, we don't necessarily have to use this, but it'll kind of help push those grains down and keep them from getting stirred up when we are recirculating in our mash. So I think we're at this point. We're going to go give this guy a quick clean before we brew with it and get cooking. Do, do a magic cut slap. Magic cut slap. I'm trying to get the glue from the tape that was taped onto the packing material, or tape the, tape the packing material onto the malt pipe. Cut off. But this little line, it's barely budged. We got this puppy clean and passivated. Now I'm going to be brewing a Baltic porter in it. So we got our grains mashed up. Peter, what is our grain bill looking like? Oh, I don't know. Okay, we don't know. We'll Throw that up on the screen for a recipe later. So let's get mashed in. That plus like maybe some chocolate. So now that our strike water is up to temperature, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, turn off my 1,000 watt element. So we have the 500 watt going. That's going to help maintain our temperature. Also on the uh, other side here, I've got my ball valve already sort of cranked down on the pump. And uh, so you can see the water's just sort of trickling out. And I'm actually going to go ahead and turn my pump off while I mash in. Uh, one last step I'm going to do is they come with this little, uh, I don't know, Buna end thing. I, it's a weird little finger condom. So that actually goes over the top of my malt pipe for now, so I'm not dumping a bunch of grains down that. Go for it, actually, and hopefully that we don't get a lot of dough balls. Got 16 pounds of grains. We're just going for it right off the bat, folks. Pump is going to help me mash this in a little easier. Well, you're going to find out the uh, grain capacity of the Robo Brew today. This pump is actually nice. It's kind of acting as a poor man's, uh, what it, what's it called? The thing's hydrator? Grain hydrator? I'll go grab the dark malts. Yeah, yeah. just got to grab these. Do it. 
I'm just gonna do that for now. There either. I don't think you really need it. Wow, that's hot. The dark malts. Thought about putting these in later, but we figured they're gonna be in a small enough quantity that it's not gonna matter. I just I went with four ounces of carafets. I went with three ounces of chocolate malt. That sounds pretty good to me. Sounds dark and tasty and roasty and stuff. Alright, are we almost to a point where we can cut it for a bit? Yeah, magical cut and we'll have this all mashed in and it'll look beautiful. Yeah. We're gonna grab some salt here. Calcium chloride. More or less a large pinch of sodium chloride. That's gonna give us a really, really malty profile, which is what we want. Malty quarter, all malt, no hops, smooth, big, amazing. Yeah. Here's what's really going on. So, like Peter said, we got an extra pound of mash I added into the green because, guess what? Robo Brew can actually hold that, so I was like, why the hell not? We're making a Baltic Porter. Let's bump this ABV up. We got good healthy yeast to pitch into it. And so, in the mash and boil, which is in front here, I actually have another five and a half gallons of water. That should be plenty for strike water, or not strike water, for sparge water. Excuse me on that one. Um, Plenty of sparge water, so I got that heating up right now. So we're gonna pull off two gallons of, more give or take, two gallons of our really, really concentrated wort from this. And we're gonna, gonna start sparging it out. We're gonna sparge it up to our volume that we need to boil uh, and some. And we're gonna start boiling this down and we're probably gonna do a two, maybe even three hour boil on it. And hopefully bump our efficiency up and prove Robo Brew wrong on the overall uh, ABV you can get out of one of these things. Yeah, let's, uh, we're, we're trying to max it out here. Uh, that's also really good in a Baltic Porter because this style happens to uh, really lend well to having a lot of those Maillard reactions that you can get from an extended boil time uh, or even a decoction mash if you were to do something like that. Uh, but we're gonna try to get it with the uh, extended boil time, uh, really bump up what, like you said, what we can get with our ABV and really make a complex, sweet, beautiful monster. Uh, let's pull off the two gallons of this wort. So shut our pump off, or should we just pull it right off of the pump? We should probably do that too. Let's just pull off the pump. Okay, let's just pull it off the pump. He's gonna go get our five gallon kettle, because you know, it's stainless and it's good and it can fit your gallons, so. Then we'll use a pitcher for sparging, since there's not a really good way to sparge with a different vessel, but uh, you know. Oh, shoot, all right, turn my pump off for a sec. Are we doing this? We just, all right, yeah, we're good. Check that out, I can just spin that around. And we got burr coming out. You've got burr. So you can see that we got uh, this little bit of metal there. That actually just helps us from drilling into the green bed, I think. That's the only purpose that actually serves. Um, and it did seem to work a little bit. Let's have a close up of that. So we don't burn up our element, we should probably turn off our uh, um, heating element right now. Peter, you should probably go do Sorry. that. You can do it. This you one? Can do it. This one. Uh, both. Yeah, just both. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Ah! Teamwork. He's used to me giving him a mouthful. Hey, it's like we've got our uh, spar drum almost. So Peter's going to attempt to lift, uh, what do we add, about 17 pounds of uh, soaking wet grains out of this now. Don't worry, I'll grunt for you. Just make sure you set it, set it in the right spot, guys. Looks like it is, uh... It's stable. It'll be good. This actually works really well as, like, a... displacer. Now that we're sparging, we might as well uh, crank our temp up a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and pause it. And, ow! We're gonna push our temp button. No, we just got hot water dripped on us, and we're gonna turn it right up to whoop, um, well, over boiling, which is 209 degrees here, but 223 ought to work. And go ahead and push play. Turn on both of our thousand and our 500 whoop, watt. Really? <laughs> there we go. Takes, takes a good push. There we go, so we got both elements on. We're heating, we have our temp set to 223, which is well above our boiling point here. And uh, now we're rocking and rolling, and we're sparging up above. We got our hot sparge water in this tank. We have our two gallons-ish of 
Uh, first running's wort set aside, and we're gonna fill this up and then start boiling. So here's what I'm thinking. If we really wanna get this as condensed as possible, we're gonna sparge with all of that water. And then if we start up the second runnings, we'll take some more off, off, off of the sparge and get this going in a second boil. So we'll be boiling twice as much. More importantly, we'll be boi boiling twice as surface area. So. And twice the energy. Twice the energy, twice the surface area. So we should be able to condense our wort down faster and more efficiently that way. Um, adding some of the wort from our uh, robo brew to this so we can boil it separately and get it double condensed, double fast. Oh, look at how caramelized that's gotten. Oh, it's so deep. Ah, it smells so good. All right, so now we're gonna, these been condensed down enough. We are going to add this to that and reduce it some more. So now we've got probably another uh, another two more gallons to reduce. This might be, you know, at this point, maybe even over a four hour boil. But uh, we're really maximizing what we got out of this beer. And uh, the, the flavors are already smelling and looking so phenomenal. So I'm excited to see what happens here. So we're almost done here on the boil. We finally got this uh, 10 or more uh, gallons of liquid down to right now we're uh, right around six by the time we cool it down we're hoping for like 5.5 so we're gonna get another like 20 minutes of a boil uh, but we did add some hops to this we added uh, 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 three quarters of an ounce of Rakao, just a little bit to give it that bitterness that we might need to balance everything out, but not a ton. We're not focused on the hops in this recipe at all. We're really focused on the yeast profile and the malt that we're getting off of uh, such an intense boil there. So uh, that's what we got going on right now, and uh, I'll check back in, I guess, when we're closer to getting this thing chilled down and adding our yeast. All right, so I finally got this done, uh, boiled down to the volume that I want, and now I am chilling it and recirculating it while I'm chilling it. By the fact that there is some current across the, the cold action of the chiller, this recirculation is going to help this chill faster. So I'm good at that. Um, also, once it gets cold, I am going to let it recirculate for even longer so that I can get some oxygenation in the wort. Uh, and then uh, when I add the yeast, I'll have a little bit more of an advantage going into the fermenter. All in all, I think the Robo Brew did a really good job. It's really awesome that they have this kind of recirculation arm. There was no stuck sparges or anything like that during the whole process, so it worked really well and uh, I, I, I endorse it. Finally got our wort chilled down to pitching temperature. What we are going to do is we're going to transfer this into a vessel. Um, we're first gonna add our yeast. We're gonna add our yeast right to this mix right here and then we're going to transfer from there into our uh, into our fermenting vessel. Uh, really active yeast here. This is the uh, Yeast Oktoberfest blend. We're going to be using that. It's a pretty strong fermenter, relatively fruity, so it should be a good lager strain to use for a Baltic porter. Now we're going to let this go ahead and mix it up and also aerate this wort. It is down at pitching temperature, so at this lower temperature, it will do a really good job of uh, uh, dissolving oxygen and helping aerate that wort and then from there what we're going to do is we're going to transfer it into our fermenter which we already got ready to go clean and sanitize. This is the Genesis fermenter. Uh, we've seen this in uh, other videos already. Uh, we're not using the sanitary inner liner for this one because we already got this uh, the HDPE fermenter cleaned and sanitized and ready to go and so what we're going to do is we're going to just turn the pump off real quick, rotate it over here, turn it back on the yeast is already in there, it's well mixed up, and we're just going to let this go and see how it works out. We're about two weeks into fermentation right now, and we want to give you guys a check-in on how the beer is fermenting. Uh, we'll do a full tasting some other time, maybe for a, a Saturday beer release, but uh, right now we're sitting at about 1020, a little over 1020. So almost there. Almost there. As a Baltic porter, this isn't going to finish very dry. I mean, there's going to be a lot of residuals left in there. Uh, I would imagine it wouldn't go any below like 10, 16 at the low end. So it might be there already. We just got to kind of wait and figure it out. Wait and see here. Yeah, this beer, we're probably going to lager cold condition for at least a month, I would say, before we end up drinking it. It's developed some really, really awesome flavors already. Uh, the one thing that's a little bit maybe off-putting so far is there's a, an extra fruitiness from, uh, the yeast was fermented a little bit warmer than we expected. Um, Very fruity. But it's, uh, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say it's overbearing though. It's, and I think it is something that as, it, as we lager this and let it sit for long enough, that'll drop pretty well. <laughs> Tastes like young beer. Mm. Actually, Whoa. no, it's very rich, very sweet. Yeah, you've got so much of that like toasted marshmallow kind of quality. like. Oh, and boozy. 
Yeah, it's got some bite to it. So the OG was 10.93. Finishing right now, it's at 10.20. Uh, might finish just a little bit drier, but uh, that's going to be what? 73, so that's right Eight now 8.5. Yeah, yeah, some more. Mid eights right now, so probably be nine by the time it's all said and done. We should probably drink a whole bunch of it. Oh, let's get drunk. How'd you like the Robo Brew? Uh, the pump was fantastic on that Robo Brew. What's the price point difference on it? So this one comes in at about $130, $140 more than the Robo Brew with okay. the pump. So worth it. If anything, it's it's definitely going to increase the efficiency of, of the system, um, and more so it just makes for a very, very straightforward, easy brew day. Um, using that pump to let me mash in those 17 and a half pound grain bill, yeah. way easier than I would have uh, with the regular robot. Trying to brew. do the recirculation that you've yeah, seen us do with the pitchers and stuff. Definitely helps with a more even heating of the grain bed as well. Right. That's another thing that's um, super useful in terms of like if you wanted to do a step mash or something or anything yep. that's programmed into there, you can the pump is, is necessary because you don't want to just be heating from the bottom and allowing that to try to you know, burn through the entire grain yep. bed. Only negative I'd say is still that they give yeah. you the immersion chiller without any of the tubing, which like we kind of did in our first review, it's like well, that doesn't help me out much if I want yeah. to brew with it. In this one, we just used our copper chiller because they didn't want to mess with putting it together. But Still a great system. Yeah. Like you mentioned before, half the price of a grain father for yeah. virtually the same thing. I'm excited to see how this comes out. Yeah, speaking of the style of Baltic Porter, people think of Porter as, as being a sort of dark and, and somewhat drier beer. And this beer is going to be nothing but smooth, sweet deliciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and even with the high ABV, it is scarily poundable. Think of it kind of like maybe a roastier and uh, maybe slightly cleaner, less uh, phenolic uh, Doppelbach. Oktoberfest yeast blend actually to ferment this too. Yeah. That is a yeast that has performed really well for a variety of styles. Um, I yeah. One thing I notice is it actually does tend to flocculate really nicely. Yeah, so it should clear up once it's done fermenting. It should clear up really well. We use it because we used it in that light lager last year. Mm -hmm. And it's more surprised how clean it turned out. Four day fermentation bright as a nickel bright as a bell bright as a silver salmon clear as a prism bright as dogs <laughs> anyway so that's about it i think that's all we have for the whole robo brew baltic porter smashableness um as my yeast is uh, settling out in the cup right now. I'm almost thinking we should have turned this into two videos but hopefully if you don't like the length of this video you let us know and uh, uh we're always kind of curious for that feedback in terms of what you like better the longer the shorter um Below, stuff, comments. Hit the ringy thing uh, if you haven't already subscribed. Thank you, everyone that has subscribed. Appreciate it. We're almost at 5,000. Comment also if you want Logan and I to do a keg stand at 5,000 subscribers. We're super excited to get to that. Yeah, I might have opened my mouth like 2,000 subscribers ago. Yeah. Yeah, apparently I have to do a keg stand on a six stool if we hit 5,000. So make sure we get over that. And let me know what kind of six stool you'd like me to bring. Oh, God. <laughs> Till next time on Genius Brewing. Cheers, guys. Pink. That four-hour boil just builds so much flavor. Don't want to check my beer because it's morning. No, oh, it's not. You're just wrong. What time is it? 11.51. That's like afternoon. It's n no, it's not afternoon. Yeah, it's afternoon. It's 11.51. It's Genius Brewing time. Big, dark, sweet beer. Noon is whenever you wake up. Midnight is whenever you go to sleep. The morning is the sleeping time. That way you can say, I'm always drinking in the afternoon. And then when you're sleeping, it's that's the morning. So that's when you can't drink. Can't be drinking all day if you don't start in the morning. Woo! Ah. Don't even know how to expel a demon. Yeah, I do. It's called going and taking a shit. <laughs> Does it burn my butthole coming out? Oh, when you jalapenos? Yeah, the jalapeno papas. They hurt so good. They so good going down and so bad oddly. Coming out. <clears throat> weird coming out. I spent like two hours in a motorhome bathroom nonetheless, <laughs> like braced against the door. Get some like lactate up in there. <laughs> some Pepto-Bismol just yeah. butt chug it. There's like the 300. Oh! Oh! <laughs> At least stand up next to you and drink some murky beer cause it's super fresh and kinda still fermenting a little bit but it's almost done right her. Gotta make a video too. What are you trying to get right now? Your face, admitting that bananas are not a berry. <laughs> By the way, we found out a banana's a berry. Suck it. So are my schnozberries, mm. so you could suck them. Probably. <laughs> but just cause I can doesn't mean I will again.
do it. Cue that sexy music. <laughs>